I uh, noticed that in the singing of this afternoon, that every one of the songs we sang, I grew up with. That is, I grew up singing. <laughs> Especially the one that caused many happy memories was, Oh, Spread the Tidings Round. Because I can, I can see Mother standing at the sink getting dinner ready and singing that song. And when we got all older, we would sing together and sing the different parts. And that's a very good, uh, I can hear her voice still when we sing that. That's what's nice about it. We were visiting, Joanne and I, a couple of days ago with an acquaintance of ours. Been seen him in a while, and in the process of visiting with him, he was talking about the end of the world coming and the signs and things of that nature. And you realize just how many people are caught up in all of that. They think that there's going to be a literal battle of Armageddon and there's all of this kind of thing. And you could see that he was all wrapped up in that. And that caused me to think, uh, you know, is the end of time near? Just to say out front, nobody knows. Nobody knows at all. And I'll just be so bold as to say, you can't find a thing in the world in the Bible, figuratively or literally, that tells you exactly or anywhere near close when time is going to end yet we have a great many people believing in God Christ and the Bible as the Word of God who are trying to go around telling us all sorts of things about that and some of us are familiar at least with the name of Hal Lindsey who many years ago came up with a book dealing with that and has written quite a bit since then which he's tried to point out signs of the times and they'll talk about the end time signs and all that kind of thing. So we are, along with many others, bombarded by a host of broadcast and telecast and books and even movies about Armageddon and the rapture and all those kind of things as uh, used by what are called premillennialists and by that they think that when Christ came the first time to set up a kingdom because the Jews did not believe in him, he couldn't set his kingdom up. So he set up the church. And he's going, in our future sometime, going to come back and set up his kingdom. I've often wondered, well, what makes him, what makes these people think that if the Jews not believing in him stopped him from setting up his kingdom 2,000 years ago? What if they don't believe in him again? Is he going to postpone it? That's ridiculous. And again, the Bible teaches nothing about that. It simply tries to make the kingdom independent, separate apart from the church. But the kingdom is the church, and the church is the kingdom. And the two are used interchangeably in the New Testament to refer to the same institution, just different aspects of it. Just like it's the body of Christ. It's the temple of Christ. It's the household of God emphasizing different aspects of the institution comprised of those Christ saves. So they say there's a kingdom that's going to last a thousand years. There's different views even among them about whether Christ will be reigning on earth over that kingdom or whether in heaven, as Jehovah's Witnesses teach, he will reign with a literal 144,000 over an earth that's been now reconstituted like the Garden of Eden and everybody else will be living there. All of that is out there. All of that is deceiving people, causing them not to be able to see the truth as it is. So you hear people with all that's going on in the Ukraine, especially what's happening in Israel right now, that there's going to be a great holocaust and the battle of Armageddon is coming and this is going to mark uh, the end of time, one of the end time signs as they use it. And then after the Battle of Armageddon, there's going to be that great millennial 
reign of Christ, all this kind of thing. This preacher Hagee down in San Antonio has a big independent type community church, and that's all he dwells on. He's a great pulpiteer, and his son's pretty good too. He just preached the truth, but he doesn't. So these end time zealots call such predictions the full fulfillment of biblical prophecy. Back in 1977, that's a while ago now, the late Billy Graham wrote this, and I quote, We could very well be living close, very close indeed, to what the Bible calls the time of the end, unquote. Unquote. Well, these folks simply don't understand, as I said a moment ago, the kingdom of Christ. And they don't understand a host of scriptures that tell us that the kingdom was established almost 2,000 years ago. It is the church, Acts chapter 2. One simple thing that comes out from Peter's sermon with, of course, it's exemplary of the other apostles' sermons, is where Peter says he's sitting and reigning. That is Christ. Christ is sitting and reigning. What's he reigning over since he didn't set up a kingdom? The fact of the matter is, that kingdom started then as predicted back in Daniel 2 in verse 44 in the Old Testament. The church is the kingdom, the kingdom is the church. And Peter, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, said Christ is now sitting and reigning. If you don't have a kingdom, you can't reign. <laughs> you just can't do it. Not in the usual sense of the word reign is there. And the emphasis is he's King Jesus. He's King of King and Lord of Lords. And Peter said he's ruling. And later Paul would call him King of Kings and Lord of Lords. He couldn't be king if you didn't have a kingdom. So I want us to look at a number of things, erroneous views, that Lindsay and a whole host of others teach on this matter for a little while. The Old Testament prophets predicted that Jesus would establish a kingdom on earth and reign from Jerusalem. The Old Testament prophets did no such thing. Old Testament prophets did predict a kingdom. But not a literal kingdom like David reigned over and Solomon reigned over. But a spiritual kingdom. Not an earthly kingdom. And that's made clear in John chapter 18 verse 36. In Luke chapter 17 and verse 21. So yes... They did speak of a kingdom. But it was a spiritual kingdom. Jesus even said, standing before Pilate, if my kingdom were of this world, would my, serv my servants would rise up and fight. My kingdom is not of this world. The kingdom which the prophets predicted, as I said earlier, was the church that Jesus built, Matthew 16, 18, and 19. And when he made that prediction, he used there upon this rock the confession that Peter made, that he was the son of God, I will build my church. He then said, I will give unto you the keys of the kingdom. Talking about the same institution. He used the word church and kingdom interchangeably. Now the so-called signs that Lindsay uses are those that are found in Matthew chapter 24, verses 1 through 35. Now, I have preached a sermon some good long time ago on that, but probably need to preach it again. Because the signs that he refers to in Matthew 24, verses 1 through 35, are signs that would precede the destruction of Jerusalem in 70 A.D. by the Romans. Not, not, signs to the end of the world. 
when our Lord there begins to speak about the end of the world where he gets very vague and there is nothing in that about how you can tell when the end of the world is going to take place. There are just simply no signs given regarding when the world will come to an end. The only sign of the world coming to the end is when it ends. Period. And that's, that's no time to get ready because it's coming the last trump. And the only thing that's going to happen on that day is all men going to call, be called into judgment and receive their sentence. Another thing they say, and we could develop all of these in much more detail and many more scriptures, but I'm dealing with the points that they try to make is that many say that there's wars and rumors of the wars. Again, they will cite Matthew 24, 6. I've had Jehovah's Witnesses come to my door. And uh, I don't mind welcoming them in. Most of the time they don't stay long, but I don't mind asking them to come in, and I try to cultivate a study with them. But I tell you something about them. When they learn you know something about the Bible, they're looking for some other place to go in most cases. Matthew 24, 6 is one of those places where the Lord's talking about signs that would precede the destruction of, the, of Jerusalem in A.D. 70 by the Roman legions. But they'll begin by saying, look around you. Look at all these wars and rumors of wars. And they'll point out things like going on over in Israel right now. My statement back to them, I said, when is there a time in history that I couldn't point out wars and rumors of wars? Even in your lifetime. Can you think of a time there was wars and rumors of wars? That was something the disciples, who didn't understand the church themselves at that time, but at the time this took place, some 40 years later from the time the Lord made these comments in Matthew 24, they would be Christians and would have been Christians for a long time and they would understand these things because they would need to know those signs down there in Jerusalem and Judea to get out. In fact, he tells them, if you're on the housetop and you see this, don't pack, leave. Let me ask you something. If Christ is coming back, Where can you flee to to get away from it? And you go on and look at several of those. That was to help brethren in the first century, specifically, not just in Judea, but Jerusalem, to escape what God was bringing as judgment through the Roman legions on the unbelieving Jews. There is no longer a reason for there to be a Jewish nation. Christ has come. He's been put to death by the Jews He's been raised from the dead. He's now ruling, as declared in Acts chapter 2 by Peter and the rest of the apostles. They have fulfilled their purpose. And thus they're removed and taken out of the way. This ties in with another idea that, well, the Jews are still God's chosen people. No, they're not. They can be saved just like you and just like me through Jesus Christ and obedience to the gospel and living faithful in His church. You've had all kinds of dates over the years that have been set. 1845, 1846, because Mr. Miller missed it in 1845. He recalculated and said 1846. That didn't work either. Jehovah's Witnesses, though they were not known as Jehovah's Witnesses then, cited 1914. It's been put at 1925 and 31 and 40 and 52 and Seven, I remember my own lifetime in 1975, and again in 1988, well, he still hadn't come. And if you remember, back in 2011, they were talking about him coming. You know, one of the marks of a true prophet in the Old Testament was when he says something, it comes true. If he says something, it doesn't happen, he's a false prophet. Well, as far as I know, after all these dates, we're still on earth in human form right now, and everything's going on like it always has been. So I, I can only conclude these are false prophets. And so we need to understand that God, through the Roman legions, brought his judgment upon the unbelieving Jews in AD 70. And when he destroyed Jerusalem, 
With it, he destroyed the temple. And when he destroyed the temple, he made it impossible for the Jews to ever know what tribe they're from. Thus, they can never worship according to the teaching of the law of Moses because nobody knows the tribe of Levi. And the priests all come from the tribe of Levi. And under the law, you can't worship in the temple without the priests. And you can't know who the high priest is because he's from the tribe of Levi, but more specifically, he's from the family of Aaron. None of them know that. I was taking a sociology class on my master's degree many, many years ago. And the fellow teaching it told us, I don't know what he was using to illustrate something, that uh, he said, I, I'm was a Jew, he wasn't a practicing Jew, but he said, I, um, I'm of the priestly tribe. Well, a light bulb goes off my mind. I said, you don't know that anymore and you know a lot of other things probably. But anyway, at the break in class, I walked up and very casually and nicely said, uh, how, how did you know, how, how do you know that you're of the priestly tribe? He smiled and he said, well, that's what my grandmother told me and all the way back well that's insufficient insufficient completely you realize besides being a, <laughs> a lot bigger war than what they got going over there now if the Jews were to go and knock down the second most uh, religious spot to Islam the Dome of the Rock that it's sitting right where the temple sit and they were to build that temple according to the specifications found in the law of Moses it would just be sitting there because they have no priest to take care of it and they don't have any high priest. They can't do any of it. So it's rather ridiculous that people rise up today and make these comments. And anybody that's learned it in the Old Testament, if they don't know anything else, should know that you cannot have the Mosaic economy worshiping or working without the priest. You can't do it. I don't think we realize that sometimes. But if an Israelite out here, say, uh, of one of the tribes other than the tribe of Levi, wants to go worship his God as faithful as he can be under the law of Moses and goes to the tabernacle originally or then to the temple after Solomon built it and wants to worship there, if there's no priest, he can't do it. Because he's to take his sacrifice as prescribed by the law up to the priest, and the priest is the one that sacrifices it and takes it from there. That's that. Thus, the priests of the tribe of Levi are simply types. Who's the priest today? Members of the Lord's church. Every Christian is a priest. We pray to God through our high priest, the only mediator between God and man, Jesus Christ. So if you were going to do your best to worship God today under the law of Moses, it would be impossible to do it according to the authority of the law of Moses. Then they'll talk about the last days. That's a term that we read of in the Bible. And they'll say that is a term that refers to a special time of hardship just before this old world comes to an end. All I can say to that is, wrong again. Isaiah chapter 2 and verse 2. Put with that Malachi, last book of the Old Testament, Malachi chapter 4 and verse 1. And then a prophet who worked along about the same time as Isaiah, Micah. Micah chapter 4 and verse 1. Go to all three of those, Isaiah 2, 2, Malachi 4, 1, and Micah 4, 1. Every one of those refers to the first, not the second, but the first coming almost 2,000 years ago. Not his second coming at the end of time. Peter, by inspiration of the Holy Spirit, writing part of the New Testament of the Christ, says the last days, put that in quotes, this prophesied by Joel, Joel 2, 28, verses following, 
came to pass in the first century. Where did I read that? Well, if you read Acts 2, Peter stands up when everybody's amazed because there's been a sound as of a rushing mighty wind, but there was no wind, and it comes from heaven and comes down. The apostles all have tongues of fire, as it were, on them, and they're speaking in languages they've never studied, and, and it's got all those people, a list of them given there, that were gathered, hearing them speak in their own vernacular, their own local tongue, the wonderful works of God. And Peter stands up and quotes, this is a divine commentary of the meaning of Joel 2.28. Peter speaking, as the Holy Spirit got to him, said, this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Well, it was or it wasn't. <laughs> Peter, by Holy Spirit, said, this, what's happening right here on this first Pentecost following the resurrection of Christ is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. It shall come to pass in the last days. That's interpreted for us. The Holy Spirit inspired Joel to speak in the future of it. Peter, when it's happening, inspired of the same Holy Spirit, says, this is that. Can you get any plainer? When somebody says, this is that, all I can say is, this is that. I can't improve on that. So the world's coming to an end, but these false prophets don't know when that is. And neither does anyone else know when it will happen. And that's made clear in Matthew 24, verse 35. So we must live every day as if it were our last day. And if you're faithful, as the Lord said, sufficient unto the day is the evil thereof. So you live today like the New Testament says. If tomorrow never comes, that's no problem to you. You are faithful today. If tomorrow does come, you're ready for it because you were faithful today. And then you're faithful tomorrow. But you see, tomorrow never comes. When tomorrow gets here, it's not tomorrow, it's today. <laughs> you talk about yesterday. You know, you can't go back to yesterday any more than you can go to tomorrow. It's always today. You live in today. Thus, if you're following the teachings of Christ faithfully, then you're ready to go whenever it is. Then they'll say, well, the Antichrist will come at the end of the world. Well, the truth of the matter is, is that the Antichrist of 1 John 2, 18 and 22, in chapter 4 and verse 3, as well as in the little one chapter book by John, 2 John Seven is not talking about a single solitary person at all. This term, Antichrist, listen, this is very important, is not even used in the book of Revelation. And yet that's where they go and spend so much of their time trying to point out all these things. Now these four verses that I just gave you listed in John. By the way, that's the only New Testament writer who uses them. Refer to those who deny that Christ came in the flesh. 1 John 4 verses 2 and 3. 1 John chapter 4 verses 2 and 3. And there were a plurality of antichrists in the world when John wrote these words. You have a whole host of antichrists today. Anti is against, you know. If you are against the teachings of the New Testament of Christ, you're antichrist. These preachers that get up and say, all you have to do is believe in the moment you believe in Christ as your personal Savior. That's all. That's Antichrist. Why? 
because it's against the gospel plan of salvation and the gospel's God's power to save us, Romans 1.16. Somebody that says the church, as it appears on the pages of the New Testament, has nothing to do with your salvation. That's antichrist. It's against Christ. All I have to do to be against Christ is to be against whatever he teaches. Now, does that sound like something John wrote in 2 John? Whosoever transgresseth, or as American standards said, goeth onward, and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ, what? Hath not God. He that abideth in the doctrine, which means teaching of Christ, he hath both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, don't bid him God's speed, for he that biddeth him God's speed is a partaker of his evil deeds. That's all you have to do to be an antichrist, is oppose Christ and his teaching. That's all. And yet they make some big to-do out of all of this. Not a hard thing. Then there's the turn rapture I like to rupture the rapture whenever I get a chance as it's used here they say the term rapture put it in quotes refers to what happens at the end of the world that's because they don't think that Christ came to set up his church he came to set up his kingdom so they make the two institutions independent one of another he set up the church sort of an afterthought. Ephesians tells us it was in the mind of God in the beginning. Because they don't understand the church is the kingdom. The kingdom is the church. The kingdom is the church and the kingdom is the church and the body. The kingdom is the church and the body and so on. They're just different terms that help us understand the realm of the saved. All believers are to be raised at the end of time. At the end of the world, living Christians will be transformed. And both will be taken bodily into heaven where they are with Jesus. For seven years before the world ends. But that's what they say the Bible teaches. Um, what can I say about this? Well, I'll say this about it. It's pure imagination and fantasy. You might as well try to say that all of the Star Wars and Star Trek and all that is taught in the Bible as to believe this. 1 Thessalonians, write it down. Chapter 4, verses 13 through 17. 1 Thessalonians 4, verses 13 through 17 does not teach a rapture. Now, their idea is the church will be raptured away. Bumper sticker, in case of rapture, this car will be empty. Brother Wallace, GK, the late Brother Wallace, drove up on a parking lot, so he told me, and there was a Cadillac that drove up there. I've told this before, you probably remember it. It had, in case of rapture, this car will be empty. And Brother Wallace walked up to the driver of it and said, in case of rapture, can I have your Cadillac? Well, that makes as much sense because it's false. I think it's important to note that 1 Thessalonians 4, 13 through 17 never mentions the word rapture or seven years or two comings of the Lord as they teach. Nor does it mention an earthly reign of Christ. That passage says we'll meet the Lord in the air and so shall we ever be with the Lord. At the end of time, the dead are raised. Those living on the earth at that time are transformed. They're brought into judgment. And there they're judged according to their deeds in the body, whether good or bad. And the saved going to heaven and resurrection glorified bodies like Christ had. And those that are resurrected into damnation. 
go into that. The final, they teach, the final great war is what I referred to already, the Battle of Armageddon. That's what brings the world to an end, according to this doctrine. Whether they're false, that's false. Armageddon, in the Hebrew it's Harmageddon, is a figurative use. Now, why was that? I mentioned sometime recently in some class that the reason that's used in the apocalyptic language of the book of Revelation, as many other terms are, is because in the warring that went on for hundreds and hundreds of years between Egypt and even some of those in Canaan, but especially between Syria, Assyria, Babylon, the Hittites, they fought it all down there in what's called the Plain of Esdralon. Very fat, flat plain. And it became so connected in the ancient world with battles that any great struggle was referred to as a battle of Armageddon. The battle of Armageddon is simply this. When Paul said, I fought the good fight of faith. I've kept the faith. I fought the good fight. I've kept the faith. He's talking about fighting the battle of Armageddon. You know what it is? It's your fight against Satan right now. Put on the whole armor of God. When do you do that? When you become a Christian. Resist the devil, he'll flee from you. When do you do that? Now. Drawn out of God, he'll draw out of you. When do you do that? Now. This is when we fight the fight of faith. This is when we put on the helmet of salvation, take the sword of the Spirit, breastplate of righteousness, and so on. Shield of faith, shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace, and we go forth to war. And we contend for the faith once for all delivered to the saints. As Paul said, we uh, pull down principalities and powers. That's what we're fighting against. That's what the book of Revelation is talking about. And by the way, in the readings that are going on now on Sunday morning that we have, the Bible readings, you're not going to understand that as to what it means unless you do some study of apocalyptic language and see how it's used. But I will say this about the book of Revelation. It does not teach anything in figurative language that is not taught in plain language elsewhere in the New Testament. And that's the important thing to understand. People go to the book of Revelation as if we're going to find something we can't find anywhere else in the Bible. That's not so. And the people who received it didn't expect to find that, except as it applied to their day and time, being able to resist what Satan was throwing at them at that time, which was more than likely the Roman government. So the great battle that we fight, we're engaged in the battle of Armageddon right now. If you're faithful, you are. If you're not faithful, you surrendered. And then the last point, Christ will reign. We mentioned it a thousand years on earth. And they'll usually go to Revelation chapter 20, verses 1 through 6. And they try to prove that. But have you noticed in Revelation 21 through 6 that it, it doesn't speak of a thousand-year reign except for the martyrs. Have you noticed that? They lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. It's figurative. They were the souls of martyrs of the first century. And there were many of them killed for the cause of Christ, such as Stephen, and beheaded like Paul, if that's the way he died. They were persecuted unto death. The one who persecuted them fell. That would be Satan. He's behind it all. Who's behind the Roman Empire's persecution of the Lord's church? Satan. If you say it wasn't Satan, then who was behind it? Who's behind all things that are against God? Who was a liar from the beginning and a murderer from the beginning? Satan. Who's your adversary, ultimately, above and beyond any human adversary? 
Peter said it's Satan. That's who seeks to destroy us. Like a roaring lion going about seeking whom he may devour. Don't you think you ought to fight something like that? Well, I think we ought to. But the figurative language is there. And so the great battle that's going on since the church was established under the captain of our salvation is the battle that we're engaged in daily and sufficient unto the day, Jesus said, is the evil thereof. And thus we fight the fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life by loving the truth supremely and not willing to surrender any component part of it or the whole thing. There's nothing magical or mystical or Middle Earth about it. There's not even a Hogwarts school of magic. Nothing like that. These are some of the things, I think I've given you about seven, that are cardinal doctrines of the false view of premillennialism. And if you go about you talking to people, you will see that a great many of them are worried to death over this. This man was, was very concerned about the, mark, the, the beast that was coming. He just hoped it wouldn't come in his lifetime or in his kids' or grandchildren's life, children's lifetime. Needless worry. Yet you see how it gets them completely away for the simplicity of the gospel and how forgiveness of sins is actually extended to man and how to be faithful in the church of our Lord. Gets you completely away from that. Sometimes we'll be studying with people. It's happened this way. And you'll think that they're doing pretty good in their study of the Bible. And you're trying to get them to understand the right division of the word, the place of the New Testament, and conveying the will of Christ, who is our Savior and only Savior to us. And you think you've got them going right along. And then all of a sudden, out of the clear blue, what about the rapture? When is the end of time? And you know you don't have them at all. So it's highly important that we teach the truth of the New Testament on the kingdom. Mark 9, 1 and Jesus said, there be some of you that stand here, speaking of his disciples, which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, folks, that was said almost 2,000 long years ago to people who were looking at the very body of Christ as he did his earthly work and listening to him and being taught by him. And Jesus Christ himself said, some of you standing here will not die before you see the kingdom come with power. If the kingdom has not yet come, there's a mighty old folks on this earth. Or Jesus lied. And that's just not the case. The kingdom came during the lifetime of of some of those that were listening to him when he said, some of you won't be dead till you've seen the kingdom come and it will come with power. Now look at Acts 2. When Peter declared Christ is now reigning at the right hand of God. Why you had power demonstrated. They were speaking in languages they had never studied and they were unlearned men as far as formal education and that amazed the people. How here we our own language and our own tongue wherein we were born. How's this happening? They were amazed. And Peter took them and began to preach as did the other apostles. And that's where he declared Christ is now reigning and he has to have a kingdom to reign. The kingdom of Christ has been around for almost 2,000 years. People have become members of it. John, uh, Paul said in Colossians 1 that we've been translated. That's 2,000 years ago. And he said at that time they were translated in the kingdom of God's dear son. American Standard says son of his love. Well, there was no kingdom. How were they translated into it? No, the kingdom is the church and the church is the kingdom. And both of those are the body of Christ. No separate institutions. Just different ways of referring to 
to the one single solitary institution of the saved. We need to know the Bible well enough to cause these people who are caught up in this, there are a myriad of them, to be able to at least cause them to raise some questions by knowing these fundamental things. If you're not a child of God today, then we urge you to humble yourself and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul and believe that Christ is the Son of God. Repent of your sins and confess your faith in Him and be buried with your Lord in baptism to obtain the remission of your sins. More than that, He does not ask of you to become a Christian. Less than that, and you cannot do it and become a Christian. Having become a Christian, you're to be steadfast, unmovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord. That's being faithful. Now, if you haven't done either one of those, or you have done the second one and in some way stopped, or you have sin in your life as a child of God, repent of it. Turn away from it. Confess it and pray God for forgiveness. If you haven't begun your journey, then you need to from the heart obey that form of doctrine which was delivered to you and become a child of God. A Christian, nothing more, nothing less, nothing else, a member of the church that Peter was a member of, Paul was a member of, all of those who were Christians were a member of that you read about in your New Testament. That's what the church is. So if you're subject to the good invitation of our Lord, we invite you to come while we stand and while we sing.